It's possible that there's never been as desperate of men as the four lepers that were standing outside the city gates of Samaria. Not only did they have leprosy, which was slowly taking their life and isolating them from their friends and from their family, but they were starving. They hadn't eaten for weeks, and they didn't see another meal in sight. What we are seeing is a group of men that are so desperate that their desperation is going to drive them to become heroes in Israel who not only save a city, but save a nation. So open your Bibles this morning to 2 Kings chapter 6. As we continue our series on taking up our mantle from the life of Elijah and Elisha. We begin in verse 24. So if you've got your Bible, your notepad, let's get started into the text. And it happened after this. Now what is this? Well, it's what we looked at last time we were together. There was a time when it appeared that Israel was going to be overtaken by groups of marauders who came into the nation and would kill, steal, destroy, take away, and go back again to Syria. However, there was the prophet Elisha, and God used this man in an incredible way. We've been talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Over in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul lists the gifts of the Spirit, but these supernatural manifestations were at work in the life of Elisha. And this prophet of God would know in advance where the Syrian army would go in to try to raid. And so he would tell the king of Israel. And the king of Israel would send troops in to block the raids. And it was so frustrating to Ben-Hadad II, the king of Syria, that he actually went to arrest Elisha. But when he goes in, God again moves in a supernatural way. He allows Elisha to operate in a working of miracles that blinds the Syrian troops that have come to arrest him. And so he leads them all the way back to Samaria. And there, when their eyes are clear to see again, they are surrounded by the troops of Israel. And the king of Israel said, shall we kill them? Shall we kill them? And Elisha says, no, what are you thinking about? You don't kill prisoners of war. Why don't you feed them a meal? So he feeds them a banquet and sends them home. And never again do the Syrians raid. However, they've got another plan. And we're going to pick it up in this story again in verse 24. And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. Now, there's a couple of things I think we need to see from this text. First of all, God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's Jesus. And his word never changes, doesn't always do things the same way. I want you to think about the stories that we've looked at. Over in 1 Kings 18, Elijah calls fire from heaven. It consumes the sacrifice. And then he kills all of the priests of Baal. And then we move ahead and we remember when Elisha is given a word of knowledge. And that word of knowledge and word of wisdom is that water is coming and they're to dig ditches. And suddenly water appears and it it floods into where the enemy thinks it's blood and they're going to defeat their enemy. So they come down and God has arranged it where it's an ambush. And they're able to kill every one of their enemy that's there. Now those two times... God brought great devastation on the enemy. This time he feeds them with a banquet because God doesn't always do things the same way. So I want to encourage you not to assume that God's always going to do things in your life the same way. Our God is very creative and he can do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. So we have to wait on the Lord. Don't just rush into things. Stop and listen for the voice of God. And again, I encourage you to ask God to give you the gifts of the Spirit so that he can operate through your life in a supernatural way. Folks, we're to live a supernatural life, not a natural life, not a normal life, not a humdown 
humdrum life. We're to live a life that is dependent upon God where we hear the voice of God and respond in supernatural ways. Folks, we can have the most exciting life imaginable if we'll just wait on the Holy Spirit. That's why the writer of Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. How many of you have ever had your understanding get you in trouble? Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. And listen, what he'll do? He'll direct your path. He'll guide you in the most incredible ways. And that is what happened with Elisha. So they feed him a banquet. They send them back. They don't raid anymore, but they come back another way. The troops from Ben-Hadad come and they surround Samaria. And let me tell you, that's how your enemy works. Remember with Jesus, Jesus soundly defeated Satan in the wilderness. He was the first man to have ever defeated the devil. And it looks like Satan is utterly defeated. But then at the end of Luke chapter 4, it says that he left Jesus until an opportune time. And that's going to happen to you and me. That's why Peter says to be vigilant. Because our adversary, the devil, he prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Listen to me. Some of you have had great deliverances in your life. God has set you free from addictions and strongholds and bondages. But let me tell you, temptation is going to come back at another date. You got to be vigilant. You got to be aware. You got to be alert. I know some of you. You have seen God bring healing to your body, miraculous supernatural healings, and I can guarantee you that your faith is going to be tested. Some symptom is going to come back, and instead of saying, I'm going to fall into fear over this, I've lost my healing, you need to stand on the Word of God and realize it's just the enemy coming back to steal from you what God has given you. And so the enemy comes. The enemy comes in to try to steal, kill and destroy. And he comes to bring a siege on the city of Samaria. Now, what is a siege? Well, in the ancient world, the walls all around cities was for their protection. This is Samaria. It was a wall that was created by Amri, the king. And it was in a very pleasant place, and it had a fortification all around the back of it. So all they needed to do was build a wall around the front of it. So how is an enemy army going to defeat a city that has a wall around it? Well, they would siege it. And there's a lot involved in siege mounds and the equipment they would use to siege. But typically, all the siege really amounted to was cutting off supplies so that food couldn't get into the city, water couldn't get into the city, and they would starve out the people who lived in the city. In fact, Samaria is going to suffer this some years later when the Assyrians, not the Syrians, but the Assyrians come in for a three-year siege where they completely starve them out and overrun and overtake the city. But this time they're coming around to try to defeat Israel. And they have all around the city of Israel, the northern kingdom, these armies who are cutting off supplies to the city. What is essential is being cut off. And here's my first observation from the passage today. We are being besieged. In America and the West, whether we know it or not, we're a country. We are a people who are under siege. And essential things that we need, that which is most essential and most needed is being cut off off. And it only became worse because of the COVID-19 pandemic. George Barna, who has done a great deal of research, did a study recently concerning the COVID lockdowns. Before the COVID lockdowns, he found out a disturbing fact. He found out that only 6% of Americans operate according to a biblical worldview. In other words, they look at life through a biblical lens. When they make a decision, they decide based on the scripture. When they look at what's going on in the world, they look at it through the prism of God's word. Only 6%. After COVID-19, that number became 4%. There is a very small paucity of 
Americans who see things from God's advantage. They see things as God would see it. And it truly is an advantage to see things as God sees them. It leads to the flourishing of a society. But because this essential need has been cut off, you can trace that back to all of the crazy problems that are going on in America. You look at America and you say, all this craziness, this insanity, how are people believing this? How are people living this way? Why is all of this going on? That's the reason we're under siege. We're under siege. Our biblical values, our biblical worldview has been cut off. Look at verse 25. And there was a great famine in Samaria. Listen, when your supplies have been cut off, there's going to be a famine. The prophet said in Amos, the prophet said that there's going to be a day when there's a famine, not of bread or of water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. There was a great famine in Samaria, and indeed they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. Now, first of all, you need to understand that these things were absolutely illegal for the Jewish people. If you were a Hebrew, you could not eat these foods. You couldn't eat a donkey. Has anybody ever tempted to eat a donkey? I've never been tempted. And people normally weren't tempted. They weren't interested in eating a donkey until there's a famine. And they're not only eating donkeys they're eating the heads of donkeys and they are paying so much money for these donkey heads that it's more money than a live donkey used to cost it's incredible it's price gouging you talk about inflation this is unbelievable inflation not only that and there's some argument over it but i think when it comes down to it and what the hebrew words are saying i believe it's saying they actually were eating bird poop i mean that's terrible Bird droppings they were surviving on. This is a horrible famine. This is a terrible, awful situation. And I want you to hear, the famine was inside the city gates. In America today, there is a famine inside the church in America. Say, how can that be? Well, George Barnett discovered it. You see, we look out in the world and we say, there's so few with a biblical worldview. But in this study, he also found that those who claim to be born-again Christians, pre-pandemic, only 19% had a biblical worldview, and now it's only 13%. Too many believers do not think of life the way God does. They don't look at situations the way God does. They have compromised their values. They have compromised the truth. They have gone with the culture instead of going with God's word. And it is a serious, significant problem. Now, there are churches all over America. I've been to some cities. It seems like on every street corner, there's a church. But I think in those churches, a lot of times, you can get good entertainment. I think you can get good how-to messages on how to better live life. I think that you can even find good community. But in too many of the churches, you are not getting the word of the Lord. You are not receiving enough of the word of God to develop a biblical worldview. And that needs to be a warning to Radiant Church. Listen, church, this is why we say all the time, we need everyone in the word every day. Folks, we have to be fanatics about the Word of God. We're to read the Word. We're to pray the Word. We're to meditate the Word. We're to believe the Word. We're to live the Word of God. We've got to develop a biblical worldview. That's why we actually go into the text and we read the Bible and we study the Bible and we explain to you biblical principles and biblical truth and biblical promises and biblical precepts and biblical commandments because God's Word is the best way to live. It's the best for the flourishing of society. It's the best for your individual life. It's the best for your family. Look at verse 26. Then as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, Help my lord, O king. It's interesting. O lord, my king. He didn't use the king's name. The king's name is Joram. 
But why didn't he use it? Well, this is pejorative. He's putting down the king. This is an ungodly king. So he's not even using the king's name. So he's passing by and a woman cried out to him saying, help me, O king. And the king in verse 27 says, if the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? He's saying, I don't have a stockpile of food anywhere. I can't help you with food. But understand, this woman isn't asking for food. She's asking for justice in a case where she feels she's been treated wrongly. Look at verses 28 and 29 because they're absolutely horrifying. Then the king said to her, what's troubling you? And she answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today. And we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Here's my second observation. People besieged take desperate measures. These are desperate measures. A little later, we're going to see the lepers take desperate measures. But here the women take desperate measures. And they were measures God warned them would happen if they rebelled against God. God had told them in Deuteronomy chapter 28, along with Leviticus chapter 26, that if they rebelled against God, if they turned their back on God, if they disregarded God's commandments, there would come a day when this very thing would happen. And now it's happening. And what's happening? They're consuming their children as a means to their own preservation. And I want to say in our time, we too are sacrificing our children in this era of desperation. We haven't resorted to physical cannibalism, but we see the destructive tendencies of every sort of injustice on our children, from killing them through abortion, to destroying their innocence online and warping their conscience in classrooms, destroying their values and destroying their morals, perverse agendas confusing their impressionable minds and stealing their God-given identities and mutilating their developing bodies, not to mention the horrific and evil crime of sex trafficking where millions of children are being trafficked as slaves for sexual satisfaction and ungodly practices. Let me say we are in a desperate time and people are doing desperate ungodly things. And in this hour, the church must rise up. We have to stand against it. And what we need in this hour are moms and dads who refuse to go along with the current of the world, who rebel against the perverse culture and the doctrines of devils that are being forced on our children. Moms and dads who make the family altar the highest priority in their home and are sure to get their kids in church under the word of God learning biblical values. We need to know what our children are being taught in our schools. And we need to protect our children from this demonic agenda of the world that comes from satanic philosophies. It's time. It's time. It's past time for the church to rise up. We must pray and make a stand for our children because this is a spiritual attack. And let me, under, let me underscore to you that this has been going on throughout history. I think of Pharaoh who took the babies in Egypt and threw them in the Nile River. I think of Herod who slaughtered the babies in Bethlehem. I think of the pagan worshipers who took their babies before the god Molech and sacrificed them. I think of the era in which we live where children are being sacrificed for our own consumption. Look at verse 30. Now it happened, when the king heard the words of the woman, that he tore his clothes, I think he should. And as he passed by on the wall, the people looked, and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. He's mourning. That's a sign of mourning and grief. They would rip their clothes, and underneath they see the sackcloth. He is in deep anguish. But notice, he's still not turning to the Lord. In verse 31, he says, God do so to me and more also, 
if the head of Elisha, the son of Shephat, remains on him today. What incredible words. Elisha is the answer. Elisha is the one who's been helping them again and again. Elisha is the one with the word of the Lord, yet he wants to destroy Elisha. Does it not sound like today? Where the church is saying we've got to return to God. We've got to return to biblical values. The scripture has the answer to our problems. And we're seen as the problem. Elijah had done miracles in the past to save Israel. Maybe the king is saying why isn't he doing it again? Why isn't he doing it again? Look at verse 32. But Elisha was sitting in his house. Now it doesn't look like Elisha's fretting. It doesn't look like he's uptight. You know why? He knew he had a sovereign God. Folks, in the middle of all that's going on, we have our responsibility, but ultimately, let me tell you, we have a sovereign God. And his sovereignty is our sanity. Elisha knew there was a God of power, there was a God of might, there was a God who could turn around any situation. So he's sitting, he's sitting, he's not fretting, he's not pacing the floor, he's sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. Who are the elders? They're the leaders of the city. Notice, they're not sitting with the king. They've given up on the king. They've given up on the government, they've given up on business, they've given up on entertainment, they've given up on the school system. They've given up because they realize the answers are with Elisha. That the answers are with the word of God. I love that. Verse 32 goes on. And the king sent a man ahead of him. But before the messengers came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how this son of a murderer, speaking to the king. Now, why is he the son of a murderer? Because his parents were Ahab and Jezebel who were murderers. And he had that same spirit of murder upon him has sent someone, that someone is not just a messenger, he's an assassin, has sent someone to take away my head. (laughs) Look, when the messengers come, shut the door and hold him fast at the door is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. Again, we see the working of the gifts of the Spirit. He had a word of knowledge. He knew what was coming. He knew that this assassin was coming and behind the assassin was the king. Why was the king coming? I think the king suddenly woke up. And he realized this is not the answer. I'm frustrated, I'm discouraged, I'm defeated, I'm upset, I'm blaming Elisha, but it's not really Elisha. It's our sin, it's our fault, it's my sin. He's realizing, he's coming to this realization, so he chases after the assassin to stop him before he gets there. Verse 33, and while he was still talking with them, there was the messenger coming down to him, and the king said, so the king's right behind him, and here's what the king says, surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? He realizes this thing came from God. Ultimately, God's in control. Ultimately, God is behind the Syrians because of our sin and our rebellion against him, and he's beginning to wake up. I think it's time to wake up. I think it's time to realize that what's going on isn't the government's fault. It's not the business community's fault. It's not the educator's fault. It is if our, if my people, says God, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. He said, then... I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. If they'll turn, if they'll turn to me. Folks, realize we've got to come to that point where we quit blaming everybody else and we say to ourselves, if nobody else goes after God, I'm going after God. If no other church is going to seek after God, we're going to seek after God. If no one else in my family is going to repent, I'm going to repent. We've got to make that decision. We've got to make that decision. Let's move to 2 Kings chapter 7 as the story continues. In verse 1, then Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. And here's my third observation. The word of the Lord is always the answer for being besieged. In this time of siege, 
In this time of craziness, in this time of calamity, the word of the Lord is the answer. And this word is a hopeful word. Basically, it's saying the famine is going to end. Suddenly, prices are going to come down. Suddenly, people will be able to afford food. Look at verse 2. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, In fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Now, the officer is the king's armor bearer. And he is saying, I don't see any way this can happen. That's a good word from God and all that, but how is it even possible? He's incredulous. I'm not going to believe this because I cannot imagine it in my mind. God would have to open the windows of heaven. But how many of you know in Malachi 3.10, he says he's going to open the windows of heaven? He said the same thing in Genesis 7, 11. God can open the windows of heaven. But he's saying God would have to do that. He'd have to do something like, like he did with manna coming from heaven. There's no way this is going to happen. There's no way this is going to occur. He's saying God can't do it. You know why? He's limiting God to his own imagination. He's limiting God to his own creativity. And some of us have been guilty of the same thing. We don't trust God. We don't believe God because we don't see how God can do it because we're so limited in our thinking. I've fallen into this before. Years ago when we were pastoring in Texas, I had a man make an appointment with me. He came into my office and he said, I'm going through a very difficult time. He was a convert just a couple of years back, had committed his life to Christ. He was a, a man who was going through a hard time in his marriage. And he said, my wife has said that she's going to file for divorce. And she has said that she's leaving me, and uh, I'm at home alone now without my wife. And I said, wow, that's really tough. I, I am so sorry. And he said, but I have the word of the Lord. Now, remember, Elisha had a word of the Lord. What was the word of the Lord? It was that this Famine is going to end because the siege is going to end, and suddenly there's going to be food where there was no food. Now think about how impossible that sounded. Just because the siege ends and the famine ends doesn't mean there's going to be food there overnight. So he couldn't imagine it. This man says to me, God gave me a word that my marriage is going to be saved, and I am going to live with her the rest of my life. And I said, praise the Lord, Joe, that is so fabulous. And we prayed together, and I prayed this awesome prayer of faith. I just knew God had spoken to him, and God was going to come through. Well, he comes back to me some weeks later, and it's an emergency meeting he wants to have with me. So I sat down with him in my office, and he said, Pastor, today the courts have told me that our divorce is final. Well, I was heartbroken. It was like somebody had punched me in the gut. And I said, Joe, I'm so, so sorry. I said, I, I'm so sad to hear this. And I knew he had to be absolutely deflated because he thought he heard from God. How many of you ever thought you heard from God and it didn't work out the way you thought? I think we've all been there at one time or another. Well, he really knew it was God. And he said this, but God. He said, God told me that we are not going to be divorced. He told me that we are going to live together the rest of our lives. And I said, okay, Joe. I was a little bit like the armor bearer. If God could open windows of heaven, then this couldn't be. I mean, did he say, did the court say it was final? He said, yes, they said it was final. And what I wanted to say is, what part of final do you not understand? But I didn't, I didn't. And so, it, that's another gift of the Spirit, it's called wisdom. And so, I, I just sat and quietly listened and I prayed, and my prayer this time didn't have nearly as much faith. Well, about three weeks later, I get a call from Joe, and he said, I'm coming to your office, I've got news for you. He comes into my office absolutely beaming. He said, Pastor, my wife has come home. And she said she wants to be married to me the rest of our lives. 
I've forgiven her. She's forgiven me. I am so excited. God's word is true. And then I ask, I ask the question. I couldn't help it. But I thought you said the divorce was final. He said, yes. But I went down to the courthouse. And they said in Texas, a divorce isn't final until one month after it's final. <laughs> God can open the windows of heaven. There's nothing impossible for the Lord. He can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Do not limit God by your own imagination. Do not limit God by your own creativity. Is there hope for America? I don't know how there's hope, but I know there's a God who gives us unending hope. He's the God of all hope. Verse 3. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? Now, being a leper was a very difficult thing. And we're going to get to the story of Elisha and Naaman the leper. And we'll talk about leprosy a little bit more. But it was a horrible disease. And they are not allowed into the city. So they would have built little shelters outside the gates of the city. Verse 4. Because they're going to have some incredible logic here. I want you to hear this. If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now, therefore, come. Let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. Now, I love that logic. Here's their logic. Here's their logic. Their logic is this. If we go into the city of Samaria, we die. If we sit here, we die. If we go to Samaria, if we get out of Samaria and we go to the Syrian camp, we will probably die. And probably is better than definitely. So let's go to the camp of the Syrians. Let me tell you, these are guys who have nothing to lose. I know about a man who used to be a thief. He later became a follower of Jesus. But the way he stole money from people was horrible. He would actually come to them at gunpoint and ask for their billfold, their jewelry, or whatever they had that he wanted. And he was asked after he came to Christ, who was it that uh, you usually went after? And he said, well, I always went after the people who look like they're pretty satisfied with their life. I looked at people to see if they had a wedding ring because then they're married and I know they, they, they have something to live for. I would look to see what kind of car they drove. I'd kind of look at their expression. If they were happy and, and they seemed like they were enjoying life, those are the people that I would rob. Then they asked the question, who wouldn't you rob? Who would you stay away from? And here's what he said, people who had nothing to lose because they fight back. These people have nothing to lose. Folks, we need to have a nothing to lose mentality. We need a nothing to lose mentality. The Apostle Paul had a nothing to lose mentality. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. And to die? Oh, that looks like a loss. No, that's gain. That's gain. That's gain. So they'd come to the Apostle Paul and they'd say, you stop preaching the gospel. And he'd say, no. And they'd say, well, we're going to beat you. And he said, well, then I'm going to honor Jesus Christ these very bruises I bear in my body to the glory of Jesus Christ. They said, well, we're going to put you in prison then. And he said, okay, I'll write the New Testament's what I'll do. And they said, we're going to chain you to a guard. And he says, well, I'll lead the guard to Christ and he'll become a disciple and he'll lead others to Christ. And then they say, well, Paul, we know what we'll do. We'll kill you. He said, you mean I'm going to die? Oh, <laughs> Yes. That's gain. I get to be in the presence of Jesus. I get to be a martyr for my faith. I mean, how do you stop a man like that? 
How do you stop a man like that? And understand we're in a desperate time. And there's too many people who are saying, I'm going to sit here till I die. There's nothing I can do. It's just how the old mop flops. It's just how the old cookie crumbles. I'm going to sit here and I'm just going to set it out. That is not the attitude of the leper. That is not the attitude of the Apostle Paul. That is not the attitude of Jesus. That is not the attitude of the Bible. We are to occupy until he comes. Having done all to stand, we stand therefore. We put on the whole armor of God. We stand in faith and we stand in power and we stand in victory. And greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Look at verse 5. And they rose at twilight. This is speaking of in the evening, evening twilight, to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, nobody was there. Now, I can just imagine this. They're intrepid. They're a little concerned about going in there. And they're going to the outskirts. Now, outskirts means around the back. They're kind of trying to slip in around the back. So they're coming in, and, and they may even be saying, Leper, leper, I don't know. They may be saying, mercy, mercy, and nobody answers back. And they look around, and there's no people there. And so they're going into this camp. They're amazed. Where is everybody? Verse 6, for the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, look. The king of Israel is hired against us, the king of the Hittites, and the king of the Egyptians to attack us. Again, the Bible proves itself to be true historically. You see, there was a time when historians and archaeologists doubted the Bible because they said there was no kingdom of the Hittites. And then they were digging around in some ruins, and they found the civilization of the Hittites. Now, at this point, the Hittites are not what they used to be, but they would hire themselves out as mercenaries, and that's what they're thinking, that these Hittites are coming down from the north. And then the Egyptians, it says the kings, because there wasn't just one Pharaoh. Egypt was in a weak state, and they had divided up, so there were different kings in Egypt. So it's very historically accurate, and they're going to thinking they're going to come up from the south and attack them. So they think that Israel has hired these mercenaries. Therefore, they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact. So this had just happened. Their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. They are getting out of there so quickly that they even leave their horses. It's amazing. What happened? Well, it's a little bit like Gideon when with his 300 men, they break the pitchers and they uh, blow the shofars and the enemy is scared and runs away from just 300 men. Only this time, there's no men. It's just a supernatural intervention of God. You could call this virtual war. All of a sudden, they hear this horrific sound, this horrible sound, and it sounds like army after army coming to attack them, so they get out of there as quick as they can, and they leave everything behind. Verse 8, and when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank. And carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered into another tent and carried some from there also and went in and hid it. So what are they doing? They're stuffing themselves with food. They're guzzling drinks and they're hiding treasure. They have hit the mother load. They have found their El Dorado. Their wildest dreams have come true. They are so blessed. I want you to see how blessed they are. They are getting Items, food, clothing, treasure that they never earned. They are experiencing a victory they didn't even win. Now, church, this is us. We are the lepers. We are people who have stumbled onto our El Dorado. We have discovered our wildest dreams fulfilled. 
We have come into a place of amazing grace that we didn't earn, work for, or deserve. Our sins have been forgiven. We have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We have been brought into a family. We have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. There's now no guilt, shame, or condemnation in our life. We are people whose past has been forgiven and our future is unending. And when we die, Death does not have the final word. We're going to endlessly be in the presence of God. And all of our wildest hopes and ambitions will be fulfilled. We have stepped into a victory that we didn't win. A victory that Jesus Christ won on his cross. But through him we're more than conquerors. Folks, we, we have stumbled onto a stockpile of grace. Verse 9. And they said to one another, we're not doing right. This day is a day of, let's all say it, good news. And we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. Here's my fourth observation. We must share the answer. I want you to see this. They're enjoying all of this. All of this treasure, all of this food, all of this clothing, and they say, wait a minute, this isn't right. There is a city starving to death. We have got to go and do something. They went from having nothing to lose to having everything to share. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. I want you to understand, we have no option but to share our faith. We have no option when we're under siege and there is a dying, starving world around us other than to declare the truth of God and the love of God and the goodness of God and the mercy of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 11 and 12. And the gatekeeper called out and they told it to the king's household inside. So the king arose in the night and said to his servants, let me tell you what the Syrians have done. We're late on time, so let me just tell you the rest of the story. He says, this is a trick. This is a war trick. What is happening here is that they have an ambush set up. And they're making us think that there is treasure out there and food out there so that we'll go out there and then we'll be killed. Well, some bright cabinet member comes to the king and said, Basically, what do we have to lose? He said, let's send out some men. We've got five good horses left. Let's take them and let's put riders on them. Let's go out and see. And they do. They go out of the city. And so they send these people out. And here's what they say again. They have nothing to lose. We're desperate. They have nothing to lose. If they go out there and get killed, well, that's no different than staying in here and dying. So just send them out. So they send them out. They go all the way to the Jordan. Why? They're questioning the word of the Lord. They go all the way to the Jordan. Then they come back and they say, it's true. It's true. It's true. It reminds me of me. I had heard what Jesus Christ had done. I had heard of his promises. I had heard what he'd said, but I really hadn't experienced it. And then when I discovered amazing grace when I was wrecked by his unconditional love suddenly I couldn't help it I would say it's true it's true it's true and so they open up the gates and listen to this the king's armor bearer was assigned to stand at the gate the people come flooding out to get the food and food prices drop I mean it's like I mean it's it's like suddenly all these prices go down the price gouging's over. There's so much food. It's still more than it had been, but it's nothing like it was. And so suddenly, everybody's need is met, except the king's armor bearer, because he was trampled when all the people came out. And just according to the word of the Lord, through Elisha, everything he said happened. Now, I want you to hear this. Whether you doubt the word of God or not, 
Whether you fail to believe the word of God or not, God's word is still true. Now, let me give you my final observation, and we'll close with this, because this one's important. We aren't responsible for how others respond to the answer. Now, notice, the lepers did their part. They go to the city. They bring good tidings of great joy. They bring the good news. They speak the truth. But the king rejects it. The king doesn't want anything to do with it initially. And the Bible talks about this. Jesus talked about hard, rocky, thorny ground, but also good ground. Folks, it's not response, our responsibility what the soil is like. Our responsibility is simply to sow the seed. We just sow the seed. We sow the seed. We sow the seed. Folks, we have got to get the news out. Woe to us after we've experienced amazing grace and the goodness of God, deliverance and freedom and wholeness and restoration. Woe to us if we do not sow the seed, if we do not share the gospel. You guys need to be shouting as loud as inner city action shouting over here. Come on. Now, 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 let, let me finish with this. Because this should be every day of our life. But, but folks, we have a special opportunity. We're getting ready to erect a 5,000 seat tent. A New Testament evangelist is going to be here operating in signs, wonders, and miracles and with an anointing to see people come into the conviction of the Holy Spirit and come to Christ. We have an opportunity. Now notice, where did they find the plunder? In the Syrian tents. They invited them to come to the tents. Do I need to connect the dots? We've got a 5,000 seat tent where people can find their El Dorado, where people can see their wildest hopes and desires fulfilled, where they can find amazing grace, healing, deliverance, and salvation. Amen. Let's give him another shout. Let's give him another shout. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the amazing people of Radiant Church. I thank you for the call of God that you placed on each one of us to share the gospel. And Father, I pray for those today who are feeling desperate. Desperate in their situation, desperate in their circumstances. They don't see any way that what they're believing for can happen. But I pray for a new hope, a new faith, and a new expectation to arise in their heart today that the God of miracles is alive and well and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, I pray for hope returning to people's hearts, that you would speak in lives today. And Father, we pray for the tent coming up this next week. The Lord, we would be those who go out like the lepers to share with people the good news that there is treasure in the tent. There is food in the tent. There is drink in the tent because Jesus is in the tent. And Father, we ask this and we declare it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.